Southern Rail Fan is the place for amazing videos of all types of trains. Southern Rail Fan, subscribe today. Looking back over my shoulder, we're looking back east on the modern day Norfolk and Southern's AS line in Marion, North Carolina. Just beyond those signals is the Marion Depot. And growing up, I spent many hours there with my grandfather watching trains pass. Then it was all Southern. And one of my favorite trains to see pass was a Duke Power coal train. It would have three six axle units at the front, usually SD40s or SD45s. And in the middle of the train, it would have either two or three more six axle locomotives and a box car. I was always curious about what that box car was. Later on, I found out it carried the electronics for the modern day Locotrol system. Southern chose to build the radio cars to save money. The car could command any locomotive that was immune to it. This all started as a brainchild of D.W. Bronson. He was Southern's president from 1962 to 1967. In the early stages, the technology was simply known as RCE, Radio Controlled Equipment. Southern worked with North Electric in Galleon, Ohio to develop the equipment. North Electric gave it the name Locotrol. Southern started this work in 1962, first tested the work in 1963, and started using it in 1965. The first radio cars were built in old FT B unit bodies. Advances in technology has reduced the size and cost of the same equipment. Today's companies installed it directly into the locomotives. CSX, for example, has begun placing stickers on locomotives that the equipment has been installed in. There are several advantages to distributive power. Uh, first is the reduction of force against the drawbar or couplers and a reduction in the force against the wheel flange and the inside of the rail. And obviously with the uh, remote radio control distribution of power, then the railroads get to save in uh, personnel. There's no more manned pushers or uh, pusher districts or helpers or anything like that. Now there's two areas that you have pressure against the couplers and the wheel and flange. And that's a train going up over a hill or a train going into a curve. Let's look at the hill first. You have cars all along and you have your locomotives down here and you have more cars here. The drawbar force on the couplers here is going to be tremendous. It'll be the you know high down here too, but right on the top of that hill, it, it's it's tremendous. And uh, you, they have drawbar forces with the locomotives pulling against the front side, and all the cars and the tonnage hanging off the back, also on that force. So distributed power. If you put a locomotive here all of a sudden it reduces that drawbar because you got this locomotive pushing against here and then pulling what little is left on the train. So that, that greatly reduces that drawbar pressure. So you could actually have, say, 65 cars 
with uh, two locomotives on the front may make it okay uh, with just those 65 cars hanging off the back. But you could put one locomotive, the 65 cars, that second locomotive, and you could add another 65 cars and still be okay in that train. There's no legal limit or anything of, as far as how many cars can can go on a train. Now the second area that you'll see forces is we're looking at the top side of the train. This is going to be our track here. As that train enters the curve, it's got tonnage over here and tonnage and the locomotive over here. So it's pulling, trying to straighten out that curve. It's taking all these cars and it's trying to draw a straight line between the last one and the locomotive. That puts a tremendous amount of force on the wheel flange and the rail. Not only does that cause friction there uh, and, and damage to the flange and wearing on the rail, it huge amount of, of force there cuts down the efficiency of that steel on steel wheel rolling. So it, it costs more for the railroads to pull that train. Now if you've got this force here, all of a sudden instead of you got something pulling here and pulling there, you've got one pushing and one pulling down. So uh, we'll take this rubber band and, and if you've got that hanging there and say this is just weight here and the locomotive pulling it, it's going to try to pull that straight. Now if you've got a locomotive pushing here and a locomotive pulling here, all of a sudden you keep the same circle and you reduce that friction that's working against it. Another advantage to distributed power is braking. Now you see these huge like BNSF and uh, Union Pacific out in the desert having uh, you know stack trains just look like cars forever and ever and then you've got a couple locomotives and there are more cars forever and ever. Uh, the power is not so much coming into play with that as braking. Now, if you had the same amount of cars, all that braking has to start with the air systems in those locomotives. And it takes longer for that air to reach that last car to help slow that train down. But if halfway through it, if you've got another set of compressors and locomotives pushing air into that system, then it's going to slow down quicker. Uh, if you had a, a car, uh, for example, have you ever seen, used to be, uh, they'd have these tough man contests and stuff, and it'd be this huge muscular guy, and he would have a, a rope, you know, a big heavy ship rope in his mouth, and it'd be attached to a, to a locomotive, I mean, not a locomotive, to a, a tractor and trailer. You know, he's pulling the tractor and trailer with that rope in his mouth, and you think, oh my gosh, he must be the world's strongest guy. Well, he's pretty strong, but it's pretty deceiving too. Uh, even something very heavy on level ground with the right size wheels, it doesn't take a whole lot to get it rolling. And when you've got steel on steel with big uh, wheels like it's on, a, on a, a freight car, it doesn't take a whole lot to get it rolling. So it's not so much adding locomotives to your train for the brute force and, and power. It's putting them in places to where you reduce these forces that would keep the train from A, derailing, B, you know, breaking a knuckle, or God forbid, not, not being able to, to, to get it stopped. So those are the advantages of distributive power. Distributed power. I keep saying distributive I can't talk. Distributed power. And of course, remote distributed power means you've still got your conductor and, and engineer in the lead locomotive that's controlling this big, big train. Now, let's flip this over. Are there any disadvantages to distributed power? Yes. 
the biggest uh, disadvantage to distributive power is switching. Uh, now, if it's a coal train, a loaded grain train, uh, a tank train, or ethanol train, that the entire train goes from one destination uh, to the other, that switching and problems with that, that mid-train uh, DPU is, is, is not a problem. Uh, of course, most most unit trains are going to have the DPU at the at the end, but on a freight train, it can cause terminal problems when you're trying to switch. You know, if you come into a into a yard, and here's your outline tracks. You know, and you come in with your train, and 60 cars back, you've got a set of locomotives that are unmanned. You know, you've got to set those off and, and do all your switching, and come back and and put those back. I don't know the details about how uh, different railroads do the switching, but that's from what I've talked to people in the industry. That that's one of the biggest advantages to having uh, mid-train DPUs is doing the switching. So I hope this uh, helped you guys out. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm working alone to kind of get better at making videos, the editing, the graphics, and and all that kind of stuff. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, subscribe. Hit the notification bell down below. Leave me a comment, good or bad. I read the good ones. I delete the bad ones. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, or any help. Or if you, if you see anything you want me to change different, change about the channel or, or make it different, then I'm all ears. Thank you guys so much for watching.